Hi, this is Matt Templeton with Keller Williams Realty in Albuquerque and the Templeton team. Today, I just want to talk to you briefly about what the overview of the purchase agreement is and how uh, the different sections play a role in your purchasing of a property. Now, obviously, there's some variability in every contract and every specific situation and, and property type. So some of these things may vary a little bit, but it'll give you kind of a, just a basic overview of how we use the purchase agreement and what it means. Okay. Now, if you have a purchase agreement in front of you that we've emailed to you, that's going to be easiest to understand these things. And if you need one filled out with your property information and what you want to make an offer on, let us set it up for you. It's Templeton. A, and you, you can email me and get it from me. My email is templetonabq at gmail.com or our phone number is 505-750-3305. Okay, so the purchase agreement first is, uh, the first couple pages are cover pages and that first page is what we call broker duties. It's what myself and any other New Mexico real estate licensee owes you as uh, as, as care in, in a transaction. Now we must disclose this prior to any written agreement and it's things like honesty and reasonable care, performance of all oral and written agreements, um, accounting of all monies, that sort of thing. Okay, We're going to abide by all laws. We're going to make sure we disclose any material fact um, and that's basically what broker duties means. Okay. Now the next page is what we call uh, cover page two and it's, uh, it's setting up transaction brokerage uh, for us and between us, okay? So I'll be representing you as a transaction broker, either with or without an agreement, meaning an agreement outside of this one, okay? We have to disclose if it's potentially an, uh, a conflict of interest, maybe, for example, if, uh, if someone else in my firm is also representing a party to this transaction, or if I'm helping to represent another party, like the seller in this transaction as well. We just close that here. Also, if I've got a material interest, meaning it's my family member or um, I own part of a property that's involved in this transaction, then I have to disclose that. You need to let me know if you are a New Mexico real estate broker so we can make sure and check that down. And then we have you sign on this page, okay? And uh, then we move on to the actual meat of the purchase agreement where we talk about uh, the parties to the transaction, who the buyer and seller are. Uh, we talk about purchase price. We disclose an estimate of loan value. Now, this number can change. If it changes significantly, we need to redisclose to a seller what that value is going to be. But if you say, uh, put here that you're going to put down 10% and you change your mind to put down 20%, well, heck, that just helps the, the seller know that you're more solid. So there's no harm in, in putting more money down. It's kind of important when you put less money down that if it changes your loan type, we need to make sure to disclose that. Okay, so we put uh, purchase price, loan amount, and um, how much we're putting down on this part. We also put the amount of earnest money. Now, generally, this ranges from $1,000 to 1% of the purchase price. And generally, it's kind of a, a money you put up to say, hey, I'm, I'm serious about this. If we get past all the contingencies in the, in the um, transaction, then that money could be lost to the seller. Now, often I tell my sellers that until those contingencies, meaning things like inspections and uh, loan and insurance, some of the other different things that you have to apply for to make sure all work out, until those contingencies are removed, that money legitimately is the buyer's. Now, there are plenty, plenty of cases where buyer and seller fight over who actually um, has right to that money. And oftentimes it just ends in a kind of a stalemate where it goes to a court and the court Processing fees cost more than the money. So really, it's important, I think, for buyers and sellers to understand that that is the buyer's money, that if they really pursue this in good faith, and the only reason they're backing out of the transaction is because of a legitimate reason that they found in the course of doing due diligence, then that is the buyer's money to keep and not the seller's money to keep. Okay, now we're going to put that with a title company. So uh, we're going to select the title, usually based on the seller's choice, and put that here. Okay, we're going to date that check as of the date of the offering and, and make sure to get that check made out to that title company and deliver it to them within 48 hours of an acceptance. And that's part of my job, but uh, please work with me in making sure I get a check from you when you sign this agreement so we can make sure it gets delivered to the title company on time. The, uh, the property address and property description are next followed by information on any water or mineral rights that might convey with the property. Then if we go to the next page, we're going to check any boxes um, for appliances or, or other components that might be included in the property that aren't automatically attached. Now in MLS, if the property is in MLS, there's going to be things that the seller has automatically offered. If that's the case, I still check those here. There's also items that generally go with the property no matter what. Those are things like the dishwasher and the stove and oven. Um, attached mirrors, okay, um, 
those sorts of things generally stay with the property always and can't be taken out. Light fixtures, that's another thing, okay? It's things like decorative mirrors that may be hanging in a, in a, you know, in a hallway or in a bathroom and may look like they're not attached. Those things we want to ask for. It's audio components like speakers that are nailed in or put into the ceiling that may look like they're attached, but we need to ask for. It's uh, refrigerators and, and washers and dryers and microwaves and that sort of thing that aren't considered really to convey automatically with the property. Okay, so we're going to ask for those things. Then we're going to disclose any loan that might potentially be there. So if you're going to, as a buyer, going to get a loan, then we want to put that in there. The um, uh, types of loans are generally FHA, VA, or conventional. A conventional loan could also be an unsecured loan. It doesn't have to be an insured, government insured conventional loan. Uh, and then we're going to put how soon we're going to apply for that loan or if we already have, when we're going to supply a pre-qualification letter to the seller, although most sellers are going to ask for that ahead of time. And then um, there's some other some other contingency language on the loan in this next couple paragraphs. Okay, the buyer has generally until the day before closing to to secure the loan. So if the lender for some reason uh, something falls apart in the, in the at the very end, the buyer potentially could still get their earnest money back. Now, if they back out and they still have a solid loan, it can't be based on the loan. It has to be that they legitimately for some reason lost their loan funding at the last minute. Okay. If we don't do a regular loan, we could do seller financing. That would be the next paragraph. Or it could be a cash uh, cash deal, and we would check that in this next section as well. If those boxes are not checked, that part of the agreement does not matter. In the next section, we talk about appraisals. Obviously, FHA, VA, and conventional loans require an appraisal. With seller financing, it's optional. And with cash per a cash purchase, it's also optional. The cost of the appraisal, we'll talk about costs in a minute, can generally go either way. And um, appraisals, I see a lot more of them falling on the seller side, although um, oftentimes I will negotiate to try and put them on the buyer side, if it's my seller. If it's my buyer, it can go either way. It really depends on how we want to structure the offer to make it uh, appealing to the seller or if we feel like we've got some wiggle room. If we're going low on price, we may not want to ask for some of those extra costs like an appraisal. Our closing date is set on the following page. We set a settlement signing date of one day, and then we set a funding date of another day. And the reason for that is with most loans and even with some wires, it takes an extra day for the funds to get there, and then we have to have recording and funding, funding being the disbursements of the disbursement of those funds to all the parties on our settlement statement, like the seller, like the title company, like myself as the broker receiving a commission. Um, like uh, any repair guys or inspection guys or anything like that, all that money is distributed through the HUD-1, the settlement closing statement. And that funding, that closing, that finalization of the closing doesn't happen usually until the next day. So we're going to put on or before a day. Now, once we put that day, generally even, even if we can close or fund earlier, the seller and the buyer are not going to necessarily want to because uh, we've kind of got it in our minds that this is the day that the seller needs to be out. They, they have to be out by 5 o'clock on that day. And I usually tell my sellers to be prepared to be out by noon on that day. But um, sometimes it's uh, – sometimes, you know, they push it to the wire. They've just got a lot of stuff to move. So just be aware, you know, funding usually happens next day, okay? Following pages are costs. The cost section is going to be um, – distributed between the seller and the buyer and some things are not required. Generally, most loan related costs go on the buyer side. And that's the first section. Unless this, the buyer is maybe uh, doing a first time home buyer program or something like that and or VA program and needs the seller to pay a lot of costs for them. Okay. The next section is prepaids and that's always, almost always paid by the buyer. Um, following section are title costs. Um, almost all the title costs except for buyer recording fees are paid by the seller. Title insurance, specifically the owner's title policy and title commitment are paid by the seller. The mortgagee's policy is paid by the buyer. If we go into the next section on miscellaneous costs, things like survey are paid by the seller. Now, one thing to note on the, on the survey, specifically for the seller, is that the, the survey, if you have a previous one, can be used again. And as long as nothing has changed on the property, they can use that same one and save you about $200. So pull out your old ILR, Improvement Location Report or survey, whichever you have, and let's see if it's still valid and if the title company will accept it. Now, a home warranty contract is something a buyer can request. 
And that is about a 13-month warranty after the purchase of the home on major mechanical uh, components of the home and appliances. So if for some reason one of those things fails in that first year and they were listed as good on an inspection report, then they can be replaced or repaired by the warranty company. Usually it's a $50 deductible on those as well. Now it's like insurance. You may pay for it and it may never make sense or may never be used. Just know that um, oftentimes sellers or um, buyers do get a benefit out of that. Um, I found several people to, you know, the refrigerated air system goes out in that first year and they get a brand new refrigerated air unit. Different warranty companies insure differently and different warranty companies cover different things. So it's important to maybe research the warranty company that you want to use. Several that we recommend are Old Republic Home Warranty and General Home Warranty. The following couple items, specifically escrow account setup, that only pertains to seller financing, and then uh, any uh, HOA transfer fees or anything like that. It's only going to matter in an HOA situation. Generally, HOA transfer fees are paid by the seller. In short sale situations, they're um, sometimes paid by the bank and often paid by the buyer or split with the buyer and the bank. Um, it just kind of depends. Each HOA, HOA, has, HOA has different fees. They can range from $100 to $800 in total fees for transferring and, and getting all the documents that we need to disclose. So just be aware of that too, okay? Now, uh, things that are prorated like taxes and propane and, and things that have been prepaid for, specifically taxes are the one that's the most common. So for example, the seller will often uh, be living in a property for a few months before the taxes are due to the county. And in that case, they're going to give the cre a, a prorated credit to the buyer on the closing statement for estimated taxes for that portion of the year that they owned the home, but but uh, haven't paid for it yet. And so that's something that prorations covers. Okay, we're going to order title from the seller's choice of title, unless um, maybe the seller doesn't care or um, the buyer's paying for the title insurance policy, then they can choose at that point. Okay, we're going to have the seller order that for us. We're going to have a few days to review that title binder once it's received back from the title company. And that title binder is going to tell us if there's any issues on the property, specifically with clouds and title or any major issues. Things like encroachments and easements will be displayed on any survey. Um, once we get the uh, title stuff back, though, we're going to find out if there's any liens, and, and that could be you know tax liens or mortgages or federal um, liens. It could be mechanics liens. It could be somebody else having a judgment against them. From that, we can then determine if those things can be paid off at closing, if those can be removed before closing, etc., and then we'll make sure um, that it's all removed and that the title can change over clearly to the new buyer. Okay. Foreign sellers, specifically FERPTA, um, only applies to buyers who are buying the house not as an owner-occupied property and and or if the property is over $300,000. Okay. Um, if the property is under $300,000 and the buyer is buying it as an owner-occupied property, even if the seller is foreign, this par paragraph does not apply. Okay. Specifically, what it means is that in the case of a foreign seller, if they owe taxes to the U.S. government that they haven't paid, and it's found out after the sale that those taxes were not paid, they, the U.S. government could come back on the buyer for that information. So it's important that we get disclosure from that seller that, the, um, t that they've paid their taxes, and if they're a foreign seller, if they owe any money to the government. Okay. And the next paragraph is on insurance. The buyer has the right to get insurance, obviously, hazard insurance, and is probably going to be required to get it for their mortgage. If for some reason the property is uninsurable, then they don't have to go forward with purchasing the property. They need to let us know within a certain number of days. They need to apply for insurance within a certain number of days, and then within another certain number of days, let us know as the seller, in, the, in that case, if they're not able to get insurance. In most cases, it's maybe one company wouldn't be able to insure because it's in a certain area or because of certain claims that have been made on that property in the past. If that's the case, we can always go and find another insurance company, usually. Okay. The next page is going to talk about delivery of documents. Property disclosure is just the seller's disclosure statement. It talks about what the seller knows about the property, and it's going to uh, give us any pertinent information about what they might have changed or what issues they might have had. It's not an end-all document. In fact, neither is an inspection, but an inspection is going to give a lot more information on what, the, what, what might be wrong with the property. Sellers just don't know everything about a property, or they may be wrong. They may say, oh, I think that was five years ago that we changed that. And that wasn't the case. Okay, they also don't necessarily know all the, the different specs of the home or the different materials that were used in building construction or in updates. So those things are generally guesses or, or good ideas. Um, some sellers are very knowledgeable about their property, but I just take this with a grain of salt. Now, in a lot of cases, we'll use these terms, delivery deadline, objection deadline, and resolution deadline. What a delivery deadline is, it's the date we must deliver the documents to a seller 
and to ourselves, um, or else we are uh, in default of this agreement. The objection deadline is the date we must have sent a written objection form to the seller discussing what the um, potential issues we find with the property are and how we want those things remedied. They could be remedies by money or remedies by repair. They could be remedies like in a cloud of title situation where we ask them to get it removed or get it dealt with. Okay, uh, It could also be an issue where we ask for a clarifying um, answer to a question, maybe on the property disclosure statement or an inspection report that deems that we're uh, something's inconclusive. Okay, The next thing would be like road documents or water, docu water rights documents. Those things only have to do with certain properties. Well documents, again, a house with a well. Lease agreements, houses with tenants. Um, permits, if houses have had recent additions or changes to the property that need to be, the permits need to be verified with Bernalillo County. Homeowners Association documents are very important to make sure we've disclosed within seven days of closing, before closing, to make sure that the potential buyer knows about uh, the cost of the um, HOA, the restrictions that they are going to cause, that sort of thing. And then the covenants, any CCNRs that are going to be attached to the land and are not necessarily HOA dis um, specific documents, but documents that have to do with um, what can be built in a certain area and what what covenants maybe the original owners have put on this specific plot or piece of land? We're gonna let we're gonna disclose whether this property is built before 1978. The reason being, if it was, you need to know as a buyer if the property potentially has lead-based paint and if the seller has any knowledge of lead-based paint. Okay. If the property is in a public improvement district, that means there's an additional tax that's uh, levied for the first few years through the tax bill, and that was used by the developer to do extensive development in new home construction areas. So that's what a, a PID is, and also we're going to disclose to you if there's an HOA that's mandatory. That's the next paragraph, yes or no. Property tax disclosure. Now the seller has requirement by state legislate by the state legislature, by the state statute, to tell the buyer about any um, increase in taxes. Now what, the way we do that is we we disclose what the estimated property taxes are based on the listing price. Okay, So we're going to get the listing, uh, we're going to take the listing price, stick it in the, the county's um, tax calculator and let you know what the potential increase in taxes could be. The current taxes are also usually disclosed to you and that's through a tax bill that can be gotten at most counties websites or ordered through the county um, assessor as well. Okay. You have the right to, you have the requirement to inspect septics if there's a septic on the property. Um, also, you have the right to inspect the well, and it's good to know if there's a well on the property. Inspections, we're going to ask, in most cases, the seller to ensure that utilities are on. In the case of short sales and foreclosures, uh, oftentimes it falls on the buyer to pay for those costs. We can ask the seller to pay for inspections. Again, in foreclosures and short sales, they will not pay for any inspections. Um, but those are things that in, that in this next paragraph that we can ask the seller to pay for. And then following, we're going to put dates on our objections, deliveries, and resolutions of of the uh, inspections. Now resolution means the date that the seller has told you what they're going to, I meant to tell you this earlier, we object and then the seller lets us know by the resolution deadline what they're going to do uh, to fix our issues, remedy our issues. Okay. If for some reason they don't want to spend the money or the money within our allowance is not enough, then they don't have to remedy everything. They can respond back and resolve it a different way. Uh, they do have to let us know how they're going to resolve it though. And if they're not going to resolve it, that we're going to terminate by a certain date. Okay, Resolution does not mean that everything is fixed or, res or completely finished by that date. It just means that we've come to terms on what the resolution looks like. And then they have a certain number of days to complete those objections by okay, before closing. The next page is going to go into more document delivery, specifically types of surveys. Now the ILR, the Improvement Location Report, is the most important and common survey that we use. In the case of mountainous or large land properties, we will do a full stake survey if there's not already one with stakes on it. Um, but an ILR basically just goes and takes a previous survey or a previous improvement location report and verifies that nothing has changed or nothing's been added. An ILR that is existing, if we have a copy of it and nothing has changed, can be used to save the seller some money or the buyer if the buyer's paying for the survey. And so um, oftentimes we'll do that. And as long as title and any mortgage company accepts, that's always um, acceptable. The next few paragraphs go over how soon we have to deliver objections and how that works, how the seller works on resolution like we talked about. We're going to put a cap... <coughs> We're going to put a cap on cost of repairs, and uh, if you'd like to see my video on inspections and repairs, let me know. Uh, the cost of repairs section is going to talk about, the cost of repairs is going to cap um, repairs and um, basically make them negotiable. If for some reason the buyer asks for more repair costs than that amount, then we, have to re we can renegotiate if the seller decides they don't want to do it. 
For example, generally that paragraph is $500 to $1,000, maybe even $1,500. If for some reason the cost of repairs that the buyer asked for was about $2,000, the seller could either agree to do it or they could negotiate and say we're only going to do a certain amount or they could terminate the contract. So there's the options, okay? And then we put the date that the objections have to be completed by. Even though we're gonna resolve them sooner than that, we put a date you know, within a certain number of days of closing. A home warranty we talked about. Um, this is where we select what company it's gonna be. If you go into the next uh, page, we're gonna get into some a lot of legal disclosure. Just some disclaimer about you know brokers not being responsible. Some of this information may not that we, we disclose to you may not be true. It's not because we lied to you, it's because it, we may have gotten false information from a seller or other things. Maintenance, the property needs to be kept in the same condition as the way we found it, okay? We have the right to a pre-closing through walkthrough as, as buyers, two days prior at least. Um, this could be in a flood, flood zone. We can check that usually with the city. Um, we can also check FEMA maps. Everything's in a flood zone. It's just a matter of whether it needs to have flood insurance or not. And then some definitions, uh, specifically what broker is. We talk a lot about date of acceptance throughout this agreement. And date of acceptance is the day when both parties have signed and the, the agreement has been delivered back to both parties as well, or to both parties' brokers. And so date of acceptance is that beginning date. And oftentimes we'll use date of acceptance as a starting point for a lot of our other paragraphs' dates. Okay. Risk of loss. If we move on to the next page, risk of loss means we don't have to buy it if the house burns down. Mediation. If for some reason you have a disagreement with the, the other party in this agreement, if with either the real estate agents, with any of the inspectors or other people, you agree to go to mediation prior to suing. And that's really just a simple task. It, the other party's agreeing to this as well. And it makes things easy because that way, if for some reason um, there is an issue, you know, mediation's free. Might, why not try and work it out first that way? Um, earnest money, I believe the earnest money until contingencies are removed is the buyer's money, but there are often many disputes over that, so just know sometimes it takes a little while to get earnest money back if we cancel the agreement. And also, um, sellers, it's not always wise to, um, to try and keep the earnest money. Usually it just ends up going to court fees. Um, the best thing for both parties to do is be considerate and consider how we can get out of an agreement quickly. If for some reason we find out that an inspection comes back poorly and we're not able to fix it, don't hold up the the transaction. You know, let the seller go forward and sell. If you're the seller, um, you know, unfortunately, yeah, you're at a disadvantage to take your property off the market. But the hope is that they would do it quickly in their contingency periods, and uh, we would try our best to get it sold again. If for some reason it didn't sell the first time. If we miss a time frame, we're in default. Um, we don't discriminate based on fair housing. In the state of New Mexico is the governing law, and uh, we're going to consent to electronic signatures. Banks don't always accept electronic signatures, but that's one um, most do, just so you know. Um, it's an entire agreement. If it's lead-based paint, we're going to include a lead-based paint uh, addendum. If it's a short sale, we're going to append a, sh uh, append a short sale addendum. If, it's, uh, if we've disclosed taxes to you, we're going to append the tax levy exhibit. If um, there's a contingency or other information, other addendum, we can attach that here as well. Um, on every page of this agreement, there's a buyer and seller initial. On the buyer's signature page, though, there's a seller's initial, and on the seller's signature page, there's a buyer's initial. So just make sure you verify that you've done all the initials at the bottom and signed the second cover page and also your signature page here under the buyer or seller section. Then we have the broker's information, just where we disclose a lot of additional contact info in case you need it. That's generally our purchase agreement. There's a lot of other disclaimers and disclosures we would give you as well, but that gives you a general overview of what our purchase agreement is and how it works. Obviously, every property is different and there's gonna be a few little miscellaneous things. Uh, if you have additional questions, email us. Our email is templetonabq at gmail.com. You can also call us at 505-750-3305. This is Matt Templeton with Keller Williams Realty, and I enjoyed uh, telling you about this. I can't wait to work with you further in this. If you have additional questions, please call my office. Have a great day.